You know, what I've come to realize, actually, about the nature of politics, friendship, and life, is that the best means of losing friends in life is to talk politics and to disagree with them over it, uh, preferably over a meal or a pint if you're of legal age. And if we roll back the clock to around five years ago, our city was going through an incredibly difficult period of time. It was one where some would characterize it as a summer of discontent of the people, whereas others would say it was a summer of unrest, of riots, of violence and shambles. As for myself, it was a summer of trying very hard to bridge two sides, two sides that refused to be brought back together in a city that was split asunder. And that was also really my first exposure to geopolitics, real geopolitics. As a 21-year-old MPhil student back then in Oxford, coming back to Hong Kong in the summer was the perfect field trip for geopolitics because it enabled me to see what happens when great powers jostle, when great powers clash, and that fundamentally, when we have two powers that strain to understand how they should live alongside one another, and the room for reconciliation between the value systems seems to be so small that fundamentally when Beijing and Washington, China and the US do not think there's an answer to be sought peacefully, that naturally speaking the events unfolded that summer in Hong Kong was but a symptom, but a sign, and indeed a harbinger of worse to come in Sino-American tensions and relations at large. So what did I do that summer? Obviously, firstly, I lost a lot of friends. Secondly, I got a lot of new accolades. People called me all sorts of names. They said, you're a sycophant. You're a capitulationist. You have no idea what people are going through. You have no right to comment. How dare you? Why don't you conform? Why don't you fit in? Why don't you take sides? Why aren't you on our side, they'd say. And I'd say, you can read my writings for my thoughts. And indeed, these writings are still there five years on in the SCMP, in Time Magazine, in Nikkei, and beyond, and I had a very simple proposition. My proposition was to resolve the deeply seated issues and inequalities and problems that proliferated in Hong Kong back then required us to be pragmatic. And that summer was anything but a display of pragmatism from all sides. And indeed, thanks to that experience, I came to realize that we, that you, that none of us here should be cowed by what others say you are and how they try to define you and pigeonhole you and shoehorn you into particular definitions. So, geopolitics, world affairs, international relations, big topics, aren't they? In the hands of if you've heard of, for instance, the idea of the Thucydides trap. Okay, one, we're doing very well. Hands of if you've heard of, you know, the Washington Consensus, the Cold War, World War I, World War II, all right, President Obama, President Trump. There we go, I've finally gotten a decent straw pool of the average age in the room here. And when many of my clients and friends and peers, my clients referring to businesses, multinationals, investors, they come up to me and say, Brian, what do we do? Because for the first time in 30 years, since the end of the Cold War, we appear to be living in a world where geopolitics is not just something that we think about after dinner, but we're really experiencing the full consequences and the ramifications of, whether it be the war in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, tensions over the Korean Peninsula, South China Seas, Taiwan Straits. The mere mentioning of these terms in front of many in a room would send chills down their spines. Not that I would check the temperature of the spine. That'd be a very creepy thing to do. And given that to be the case then, of course, we're tempted to think, what can we do? Some would say, there's nothing we can do, especially you guys, okay? You're all just students, teenagers. You'll realize when you grow up that there are lots of things in life you can't change, okay? You're Chinese, you're American, you're British, uh, you're from Ghana, you're from South Africa, your nationality has determined your identity, has determined your stance, has determined your belief, has determined what you can and can't do. And then some would say, forget it, you know? Don't look up. I'm just gonna look inward, I'm going to turn inward and forget about all that's happening around us in the world today. Why? Because it feels terrible. We feel helpless as we watch 99 red balloons fly by. And indeed, one of them apparently, according to certain American think tankers, could be a spy balloon, so to speak. 
But I say differently. I see the world differently, and I think we do have a choice. I'd say we do have the ability to make a difference, not just for ourselves or our family or loved ones or our society, but also for the world at large. This is a picture from 1971, essentially the 31st World Tennis Championship. And let's remember that that was, you know, at the height of the Cold War, a time when America and China weren't really talking, you know? And that in this championship in Japan, one day, uh, an accidental Chinese player or an accidental player, you know, who played table tennis, he stumbled onto a bus, okay, filled to the brim with other Chinese table tennis players. And this was an American player called Glenn Cohen, who was 18 years old, so just a few years older than you, and the excellent speaker that came just then. And no one in the Chinese delegation dared speak with him because he was an American. Dangerous, apparently, you know? Who knows if he'd be accosted for talking to the other side, so to speak, divided bitterly along this iron veil. And yet, one of the players on the bus, a certain Zhuang Zedong, said, you know what, I'm going to reach out. And so he reached out initially timidly, and then he became more strident as the conversation prolonged, and he, he showed Glenn Cohen uh, an image, okay, of the Huangshan Mountains, a painting. And in reciprocity, the, the American tennis player, or the American table tennis player, you know, said the three words, let it be, a reference to Beatles song for those of you who are old enough to remember the Beatles, so no one in the room, uh, including myself, and furthermore, you know, presented him with a shirt and said, you're more than welcome to visit America. The news went back, and it got back to the leaders of the two respective countries, especially the Chinese leadership back then. And whilst the leader then, Mao Zedong, had initially been quite flabbergasted and annoyed, you know, after a few weeks or days even, he said, you know what, that table tennis player has a real sharp political mind because that provided China with a critical opening for a series of talks, negotiations and dialogues which eventually culminated in, yes, President Richard Nixon visiting China in 1972, therefore putting an end to the frost to the animosity and the tensions between the two countries during the Cold War. And what this exercise shows to us all is that fundamentally the human touch matters. Because what Glenn Cohen said in 1971 is he observed that, you know what? The people are just like us, the Chinese people. They're real, they're genuine, they've got feeling. And so in face of that, I want to do a bit of a straw poll. What are the key techniques and sharings that you know, I, with my very limited time span spent on Earth thus far as well, would hope to share with you all in terms of how we can take on the geopolitical behemoth, how we can reclaim our agency when the voices around us tell us that we have no agency. Quite simple. Step one, trust but verify. Hands up if you've read from more than one news source today, maybe two news sources. Okay. Hands up if you've read from three news sources today. Four, five, all right. And hands if you read from news sources in more than one language. Okay, great. Two languages, more than two, so three. All right. Four, we're doing very well. Multilingual, polyglots, talented individuals. This is island school. And this is in many ways also an embodiment of how I think we ought to approach news sources, information sources, people with different ideas and opinions. Have more than one or two or three or five sources from which you draw and always trust them enough to listen to them, to think about what they're saying, but also to verify, to cross-check, to corroborate and ask, what is behind their agenda? What is underpinning their motivations? What are their intentions here, so to speak? Step two, ask inconvenient questions, you know? In life, we're often taught, how do we answer this question? How do I answer that question? How do I you know, design all the steps required to get an A star in the exam? How do I please the boss? How do I please my mates? But fundamentally, in geopolitics, in an era of increasing volatility, we've all got to learn to ask questions. This was me when I asked Slavoj Žižek, Noam Chomsky, and also Shashi Tharoor, you know, a dear friend actually, about what he thought you know, concerning what they thought about their respective theories and their defects. I founded the Oxford Political Review alongside three other co-founders when I was at Oxford in order to ask inconvenient questions, to put thinkers on the spot and to say, you are not unchallengeable just because you are the former secretary for labor in the US 
or that you're in charge of environmental policy in the US does not mean that you're infallible, or that you might be a lord in the House of Lords in the UK, and still we should be allowed to contest your claim and your reading of Brexit, because you and who you are depends or determines not how much I should trust you. Instead, how much I should trust you deter is determined and depends largely on how credible you are and how strong and how well your argument should stand up to scrutiny. And that, to me, is a second step to surviving in an era where misinformation, where deep fakes, where proliferation of propaganda is everywhere and ubiquitous. The third thing to note is what is your niche? What are your niches? Can I get some shout outs? What are you specializing? What are you good at, guys? Anything? Skiing. Swimming. Good. What else? We're all good at something, even if we're not good at anything, we're still good at something, which is being good at nothing. So in short, we've all got our own individual niche, if not niches. And what I want you guys to realize is that by harnessing them, by focusing on them, by doubling down on practice and doubling down on remembering that you can and should be allowed to make a difference with them, you too can build the bridges that we deserve. And this ties me on to the final point very quickly today. This is a picture I took of our home. The final point I want to raise is remember your roots and remember your home. I was an islander 11 years ago. I spent my high school days here. I'm a Hong Konger. I was born and raised here. I spent eight years in Oxford, and yet at the end of my default, at the end of my you know, education career there, I said to myself, what am I going to do? And the answer was straightforward. I'm going to come back to Hong Kong. I'm going to make this place my home again. And that is why I chose to join the University of Hong Kong as an assistant professor, teaching what I love, teaching the most philosophy, in a world that seems so unforgiving, we have to remember where we belong and remember our own calling. And the final thing to note here is, don't be afraid to be disliked and don't be afraid to be different from the norm, from the crowd and from the masses. Because in the era of geopolitics, staying true to yourself is not enough. Staying true to humanity is not enough. Staying true to being willing to adapt and change, that's what's enough. So thank you all very much. Thank you.